I was worried we were going to be too crowded. I think we'll be fine. Yeah, I think we can squeeze in. Come on, you guys come this way. Let's go. Let's go. So this is my friend Tom Nell. We met um, while he was a student here at Caldwell Community College for um, the AFA degree, which uh, several of you are going through now. Um, Tom graduated in 2012 and then uh, transferred to UNC Charlotte. Um, and he's got an awesome story to tell. So. Hey guys, um, like uh, Tom said, Tom Nell, he, he, when I was here, I think he went by Thomas and I went by Tom. But I got by Thomas still. <laughs> I, I always called him Tom because that was my name. But, um, so what you see around you is uh, some of the art that I've been making. Some of this stuff dates back to the time that I was here. Um, these three pieces here were actually created at Caldwell. The centerpiece was actually uh, to the uh, design uh, assignment from Tom's class uh, that still kind of holds up. I still I still enjoy the piece, so I still drag it around. Um, to understand the what, the why of me making art, you have to know a little bit about my biography. So I'm going to tell you uh, about 49 years of. Uh, you only need to about three or four. Um, I joined the military when I was 19 years old, and I was a paratrooper. I served at Fort Bragg, and we were, you know, the the emergency deployment force for the, the army. And so, whenever anything happened, we had to be on alert and ready to go. Well, um, that sounds pretty high speed, uh, but. It, it, you know, I didn't think anything would ever happen. We hadn't done war since Vietnam. It was 1989, 90. Uh, 89, we went to war in Panama. I got to skip that one. But then 90, um, and on August 10th of 1990, this guy named Saddam Hussein decided that he was going to invade this country that nobody had ever heard of before. If they didn't live there, it was called Kuwait. But that country happened to have like a third of the oil reserves in, in the whole world. So that's what made it important. And um, so before I knew what was happening to me, I was landing in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, and uh, participated for the next nine months in what became known as Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Um, not a lot of the work on the walls here is about, uh, about war or any, anything that relates to that. I do a lot of, well, the helmets are, are going in that direction, and you guys can handle these later, but um, I do a lot of art, I create a lot of art that's related to that topic of, you know, what, for me, coming back from nine months of war to the United States with no transition, that, it's really, really weird if you if you haven't been through it because your life is, you know, trying to keep the sand out of your food and, you know, where are you going to go use the bathroom in the middle of the desert when there's no trees and you can't hide behind anything, and, you know, um, and just, you know, where's, what you're going to eat for your next meal. Don't silhouette yourself against the sky so you don't get shot. Those types of things that you think about day to day, and then you get on, on an airplane and you come back here, and everybody's going to the mall, mm -hmm. and they're going to the movies, and they're hanging out, and they're doing the same things that they were doing when you left, and, and probably half of them don't even know there's a war going on. And it's it's a kind of a rough transition. Um, I don't think I, I don't think really most soldiers that come back, especially combat armed soldiers, get um, get any transition at all. And so that has a has a role in my thinking, and it helps me to produce some art. But none of that's displayed here, other than the helmets today. Um, so fast forward thirty years, twenty years. Um, in uh, January of two thousand ten. January 10th of 2010, I, by that time, had been working as a, a computer network engineer for 22 years. You know, that, that was my career. I went, to, I went to work every day and, and pretty much hated my job because 
Every day I went to work, I was going to something that was broken that somebody was really pissed off about and they wanted to have fixed right now. And it was my fault and I needed to take care of it, right? So uh, some people might say that it was it was providence or the universe or God. It you know, just depends on, on how you believe. But on January 10th of 2010, I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And uh, that night, a cardiologist sat across from me in the, in the hospital and said, this is what you got. Your heart doesn't squeeze anymore. We can give you drugs and it's going to make your life better, but there's no cure for this other than a heart transplant. So fast forward another, another couple of years and my health degraded to the point where they ended up putting a, a pump in my chest to substitute for my heart. So when you see the gears, and especially gears related to, you know, put next to the heart prints, that's, that's what I'm refer referencing there. Um, and then, after two years of living with a pump in my chest and a line that came out of my gut and batteries that went under my arms, um, I got a heart transplant. So uh, my heart is 25 years younger than I am which is, uh, it's good for me. It is a blessing that the, the individual that, that provided this heart for me chose to be a, an organ donor and his family uh, chose to donate his organs. Um, I never forget that. You know, uh, no smoking, no drinking. I don't even ride motorcycles anymore uh, because I think that, you know, putting myself at too much risk and, you know, being careless and killing myself would, would be completely disrespectful to his family. Um, but so now that kind of puts all, all, all these hearts that you see all over the place and, and other things into perspective. Um, the piece here with all the small prints is a, a way that I express sort of the, the thought process after the transplant. When you have a heart problem, uh, your brain says, oh God, if, if this thing dies, we're out of here. So it starts dumping all its chemicals, dopamine, adrenaline, serotonin, and basically you're all over the place. Back crap crazy. Uh, it's, what it, it's what it becomes. And so, um, like today, I don't, I don't take any heart medications, but I take a whole bunch of head medications. Um, but this represents sort of the thought process um, that I had after heart, after my, my heart problems were diagnosed and I went through that chemical dump of my brain. And it's basically, if you look at it, it's the same images repeated over and over again, but they're repeated in different colors and different uh, values, meaning some are darker and some are lighter. Uh, they're repeated in... Uh, in uh, different shapes. There's no commonality to the, the shape of the, of the print. They're pretty random, which for most people that, are, that have learned to be a printmaker, when you, learn, when you first learn to be a printmaker, you learn how to create prints like this that are identical to each other in a series, one of 10. Um, I've kind of fought that since I've been a printmaker. Um, so you won't see any any consistency in the size of the paper here. Won't see any uh, any consistency in the way that the, the plates were inked, uh, any of that. And, and the idea behind that is that the, these thoughts and these feelings, you know, they come at different times in different ways and you re I react to them differently, but it's all a repetition of the same thing over and over again. So, that's how we get to a very large matrix of very little prints. And I brought some prints for you guys to take a look at so you'll know what these look like before they go on the wall. Um, some of these are done with uh, what's called kitty-kata paper, which is the, the beige paper, which is a Japanese rice paper. And then the other, the heavy-duty white paper, is called Stonehenge. That's pretty common, um, commonly used. I think we used it here. Um, to give you an idea about the process, 
when I was thinking about doing this, I mocked the entire process up digitally. And, and um, is it Jason? Jacob? Okay, that was close. I don't have any short term memory, so don't, don't take that first. Um, when, when Jacob and I were talking about, he, he was telling me that he was not satisfied with his ability to draw the human figure. And that is one thing that no art teacher has been able to teach me yet. Um, my drawing skills are atrocious. Um, but I can still make art because I can still use the tools around me. This entire piece was mocked up first in Photoshop. And so by scanning four or five of the small prints that I, print, I plan to use, I was able to lay them out and see somewhat what would, what would turn out if I did the, uh, the grid. Now, it helped me with a lot of things. One of the things that it helped me with was to make sure that I had a boundary around each one of the prints, that they were separate. Because if you see in the, in the mock-up, they run together, and it's, it doesn't read as ordered. And I didn't really want it. I wanted it to be like individual prints and not just a great big pile of printed stuff, printed matter. Um, so this technique is going into a show that I'm doing on the 12th. And, uh, and so this is a test of that. This is a self-adhesive vinyl um, that I'll be printing on, similar to the, the digital prints that you see there. Though the prints that were scanned for these hearts are that size. They were three by three inches. Um, that's the wonderful thing about the print shop down at UNCC. We have really good printers, and so um, if you, especially with the, the piece outside, if you look at it closely, it looks like you can see the embossments as if you could touch them, as if you could feel the embossments in the paper, but it's just a digital image that was enlarged from a smaller image. Um, that, but that gives me a lot of flexibility to be able to work small and then display large because everybody likes big stuff. You know, that's, that's all artists, when they, especially when they're going through like their senior show, they want to do big work. And so they need to fight in the gallery about who gets who, what space and that kind of thing. But anyway, I'll pass this around. These are, this is just an experiment that I did adhering these prints to the self-adhesive vinyl. And basically, this is the type of vinyl that you just rip the back off while you need to stick it to a ball. And um, I'll be doing work with that type of vinyl, printing that type of print, uh, only it's going to be about 9 feet by uh, 15 feet tall. And then I'll be using um, some of these techniques to fill some of the negative space around. It's going to be a heart, obviously, um, around the heart. And, and to, uh, because I don't, I don't necessarily want to cut it out uh, and just put it on a wall and have the wall be the background. So I want the heart recess a little bit so there'll be these little prints around it. Um, the rest of this stuff is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, this print right here, you see over and over again here. Um, the, uh, the prints in the back are a derivative of this assignment right here. Um, when we did this 2D uh, design assignment, I sort of took that and, and started to deconstruct some images into, uh, I won't say pixels, but into cells and, uh, and to see how I could use the values um, and create the values with multiple lines. Um, I can't draw, like I said. But uh, I feel like one of the strengths of my printmaking is my line work, the, the actual stroke onto the, the, the uh, plate. Um, at UNCC, we have laser cutters and CNC routers. So I could, I could take a picture of myself and put it in a, and transpose it into a laser printer, and it will cut my figure into a, into a plate. And I don't even have to touch it. But then I lose the, the marks and the subtleties of going from, you know, from heavy, hard marks to, to the lighter marks that you see in each one of these. Um, but trust me, that, 
that technology is really nice. So the helmets. The helmets refer um, to my military experience and and it's uh, when I was here I did a, 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 it was not a show but it was a sort of a small exhibition that I called headgear and there was a painting in it um, that included a helmet and some pill bottles uh, there was a video with some pill bottles in it and it's still online um, and there was a grid of prints that were basically camouflage patterns that I had created out of pill bottles because um, in coming back from, from war, you know, these guys are, are being uh, just loaded with antidepressants and antipsychotics, uh, anxiety drugs, opiates. So I wanted to express the relationship between the drugs and the people. And, it, and basically, as a camouflage pattern, it's the, it's the pills and the drugs hiding the problems that still exist and haven't been treated. Um, so that was 2012. It was like the last thing that, that I did in 2012 before I left here. So these actually refer back to that work. Um, I wanted to start integrating uh, printmaking into 3D composition. And I've got, whole, I've got a whole bunch of ideas about that. But I needed to start small and, and know that I could, that it would work. and. Um, these are are brand new, fresh, and I, I displayed them for the first time this week. And the the assistant chair of the art department at UNCC was teaching a class, and I was walking in as he was walking out, and I was setting these out on the table. And he stopped, and he came back, and he said, "You made these?" I said, "Yes." And he said, "These are all Italian prints." I said, "Yes." He said, "These are remarkable," and it was like the the greatest moment, you know, in art school for me right there. Um, this guy's the head of the illustration department and he's, the, like I said, the co-chair for the, for the entire art department at UNCC. So I figured at that point that this was working. So I was going to try and um, expand upon it a little bit. Uh, I think the next, the next ones that I make will probably be mortar shells, probably about this big, um, paper mache again. I don't know that I'll cover them necessarily in, in these personal type prints. Um, you know, these are the, the self, sort of abstracted self-portraits and the heart are all about my life now. Um, and just to explain a couple of things, you, you'll see the owl in this. That, that references what I was talking about with, with your your brain function when you get heart disease because you I lost when they put the pump in my chest I lost 15 IQ points and then when they did the transplant I lost another 10 IQ points um, because when they take your heart out and they lay it next to you um, and then they have to hook it up to a bypass pump and your brain doesn't get the oxygen that it needs and the longer that takes the more of an impact it has on you so um, sometimes I can't find my words, sometimes I stumble around the house looking for my keys for a couple of hours. And that's what, you know, when you think of the owl in traditional art sense, it's, it's about wisdom. Um, and so I use it to reference the, you know, the wisdom that I don't have anymore. Um, or, or that, you know, that has uh, gone with the, with the heart. But, it, it was worth it, trust me. <laughs> um, so you'll see that you'll see that occasionally. I just wanted to explain that. Um, but the next piece will probably be uh, mortar rounds uh, because that was my job when I was in the military. I was in the infantry and I fired really, really big guns. And um, so mortar rounds, maybe even a mock um, M16, a mock grenade launcher, um, those types of things. But with uh, with imagery on the outside of them that talk that explains what those things mean to me now and what they mean to my thinking now um, as opposed to hey it's, these assault rifles are really cool because they're not I mean the, the, the sole purpose of an assault rifle is to kill people and that's not cool 
Um, so anyway, that's about that's about all I've got. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to to answer them. Please. <laughs> I'm, curious, I'm curious about the smoke drawing. Okay, this actually is a derivative of another assignment that that was um, here. Uh, Jane uh, Wells Harrison was the head of the art department, and she was a painting instructor when I was here. She was my. I think that was 2D. Another no, that was that was a, like a painting one. I think we had to design a book cover, and if you're familiar with the Penguin books. Um, there's a specific layout that the Penguin books have that's gone back 50 years. It hasn't changed. And so we had to do a, a, a graphics design uh, piece on a story that we read. And I read two stories for that. One was by uh, um, Ray Bradbury, who was famous for the Marsh Chronicles. The name of the story was The Velt. If you guys have ever heard the Dead Mouse song, The Velt, that's what, it, that's what it's about, is that story. And then the second story that I read was uh, Franz Kafka in the penal colony and if you've ever read Kafka it's hard to believe that the guy sat behind the desk and was an insurance agent because he's his mind is way out there but uh, the Kafka one was the most successful and so we had a an assignment in our printmaking class to do a smoke drawing and combine that with digital uh, digital imagery and so I went back to that, uh, the Penal Colony book, and thought about that. And the, the gist of the book is that there is a machine there that issues punishment for crimes that they deem to be egregious. And that machine, they call it a bachelor machine, but it's basically, it carves your sin into your body. You know, like I said, Kafka's a pretty, pretty rough read. Um, so I had a lot of gears from doing the print, so I used those, the gears to represent the machine in, in the Kafka story. And then the Pink Colony was located on a remote uh, island. It was described similar to like the, like the Bahamas or the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so the this is actually a photograph of uh, under a pier the the uh, perspective photograph and it's just you know it's, it's a trick with a camera where you blur the background and, and you make the foreground sharp so I could combine those two pieces of imagery um, and then the lettering be just at the top has to do with the story and I, if I tell you what that means then I'll blow the story for you but go, go look it up you can read it online and the, the, the whole story is three pages long and it's and then you'll understand what we just meant. Um, but so that's the. How how did you make what is the smoke drawing? How did you get that smoke? Drawing? Okay. Um, it's really interesting that you asked that. Put this up right in the butt. Um, <laughs> so you have to have printmaking is all about uh, stencils, basically. Um, the first printmakers were the guys in France in the caves that put their hand on the wall and painted around it. And that was their stencil, was their hand. Um, that's advanced to the point now where we have screens that we can do multicolored and, and everything else, but it's still the basic process of that is a stencil. So to, to create the smoke drawings, I needed a stencil. And the stencil was the negative cutouts when I laser cut this this gear right here, there was a piece of plexiglass left over with a gear cut out of it. And so, in order to create, see, you gotta, I screwed up the back of this one first. Um, in order to create the smoke drawing, you, we use uh, what's actually a screen printing table to hold these upside down. You apply your your uh, stencil, whatever it is and then you actually burn with a candle. And you, you have to use a paraffin candle because otherwise you get sort of this effect. So you have to use a pure paraffin candle to get the right carbon 
on there. Um, but that's how it's created. It's a very, very, very simple process. And um, just don't set the paper on fire. Make sure you got a big container of water close by and maybe a fire extinguisher um, because the paper at some point will catch fire. Um, it helps a little bit if you dampen this paper first. Um, but I definitely printed the digital portion of this first on this particular print and then did the smoke drawing over it. Because if, if you try to run, if you did the smoke drawing and then you put this in a, into a fine arts printer, it's going to kick it right out. It's not going not to like it. And even if it did print it, it would take all that carbon and just strip, it would scratch it across the, the print. You wouldn't be able to tell what the, what the stencil was. And then at the, at the end of it, you just, it's just like a, a charcoal drawing. You, you want to fix it, so you put the hairspray or whatever your fixer is on. That's it. Cool. Any other questions? I have a question about these two right here. Okay. Just in general about. Um, There's actually a story about those. <laughs> What's your question? Basically, what the story behind them is. Okay, so there are certain classes that you have to take in, if you're in art school. You know, 2D design, 3D design, you have to take those classes. Um, this class that I was taking at UNCC is called Book Arts. And basically, you go through the process of making books with different techniques where you, you use a, a weave for the binding, you know, all, all different types of techniques. You have a, an accordion type book. So the first thing you do at the beginning of that semester, and this was a short semester in the summer, um, is you make your paper for your books. So, I mean, you hand make paper. These, these are not handmade paper, but you actually go in and you hand make paper um, so that you're, you learn about the fibers and how that's created. Well, we did some monoprints to prepare paper to go into books. And this is basically um, a plate with just pieces of torn out paper that were placed above it to keep parts of it from printing. This was a piece of netting that, was, that I just stretched out and put over the paper so that it would block the, the ink in some places and not in others. Neither of these was meant to be a work of art that was displayed on the wall until I asked Thomas to help me curate the work that I was going to put in here. And he said, these are great. You ought to put these up. I was like, no, they're not really. Okay. <laughs> but um, he said, you know, he said, that looks like a heart. So it's a type of heart. But that was the purpose of these. These are both the kitty kata paper that, that you saw with the smaller prints, the rice paper. Um, so these were meant to be folded up into pages and maybe printed on or drawn on to make a book. Problem is that I started dying like right after I made these and had to go get a heart. So I didn't finish the class. I have a question about uh, concept or um, sort of the, some of your intentions behind the idea of the work. Um, is it meant as, or do you make, create the work as sort of a catharsis or like a way of personal healing and understanding, or is it meant to make like um, an impactful statement that could make social change, or is it some combination of the two? It, it's a combination. So when you talk about uh, creating a piece like this, you have to print every one of these individual plates. And if any of you have been into, into your printmaking class yet, you know that you scratch your plate, you ink your plate, you wipe your plate, and then you print your plate. So imagine doing that 600 times for this one piece. That doesn't include the ones here, the ones on the helmets, the ones that are in my car, all over the place. It becomes a bit of a performance. You know, it, we talk about, uh, if you haven't talked about it, you will talk about it at some point, the abstract expressionist um, or artists that we're at the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, and the most, most famous one of those is Jackson Pollock. Everybody knows the Pollocks. You know, they, they're paint splattered all over the place, they've got footprints and handprints in them, but the, the idea was not that he was creating an image, it was a performance. It was his, that was his therapy. 
because he had a lot of demons. And I've, I've got a lot of demons too. And so this becomes a performance for me to, to create you know, the, the labor of the, of the prince, laying them out and then sitting in the floor in here and putting them down one at a time onto the, uh, the loop material is definitely therapeutic. But at the same time, well, at the same time, I want people to to consider the labor as part of the as part of this because um, you know when you consider having to focus for that long and what it takes, especially when your when your brain's been scrambled like eggs, uh, it's it's pretty significant. That it, it is definitely therapy for me, but. I also want people to be able to take, um, you know, take something away from it that's significant to them. Um, whether it's, you know, a sim sense of repetition, a sense of um, personal, like the the, the abstracted self-portraits, a sense of, you know, personal worth or, or your vision of yourself personally. You know, I, I can't stand looking at myself in a mirror because, you know, that's me. You know, I've been looking at that same guy for. Half a century, and you know, he just doesn't get any better looking. I don't know what the deal with that is, but um, but uh, I want people to get the reason I'm I'm really kind of short and sweet with the titles is that I don't want to put something in your head about my art. I want you to come to the art, and I want you to experience something with the art. It means something to you. I, I give you my background about the hearts and the gears and the stuff like that so you understand what I intended when I made the art, but I also want you to come to the art and to be able to have your own experience. So I'm not going to put this as the thought process Han Neil had over after you, blah, 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 you know, as a title. I want you to walk up to this piece and say, wow, this looks like, or this makes me feel like, or, you know, whatever. And, um, and then maybe you get the, the spiel about, you know, the brain dump and all that stuff later. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely both. Well, because you were talking about, uh, you know, the helmets and then your work with um, guns and everything. And that seems a lot more politically charged than, like, gears and hearts. And so I'm wondering, like, where it will go into the future. Well, because people are really touchy on those issues. Yeah, and I am a real sucker for politics. I want to create art. Uh, I know Lindsay's done a lot of political pieces, um, but I want to create art that tells you how to think because I know, you know, the way that things should be done. And if everybody just thought like me, the world would be great. Well, that's not the case. <laughs> And my instructors have steered me away from a lot of the political art that I've tried to, to go into at UNCC because um, I'm not as smart as I think I am, obviously. And uh, I'm not even close, actually. Um, and so what happens is I'm easing people into their experience with me to have a relationship with me as an artist. And to understand where I come from as an artist. And then I feel like as I mature, I'll be able to bring some of those issues into my art and people will know why I feel the way that I do. Um, you know, if, if it were up to me, there were, I would have a, I actually created a piece that was, uh, it was the size of a panel of sheetrock that was, it had a, a Muslim woman basically cut out in it. It was a, almost like a pollock. It had all kinds of colors and everything. And it had a, a Muslim woman that had been cut out. It was right after the first travel ban. And I was all fired up about that. And I was going to show it. And I took it in a crit and, it, and they tore it apart. And it, so it's sitting under my deck right now. I think that it's shielding um, some of my dog's toys or something like that. You know, I would really like to, to be in your face sometimes with, with political stuff. Um, I had to have that uh, the voice of reason, and um, you know Dr. Emerling. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Emerling has been sort of the voice of reason for me, among other people. Uh, Dr. Emerling is a is a world famous uh, art historian that works at UNCC, and his uh, sort of specialty 
all those guys, the doctors, they all have something that they specialize in. His specialty is modern and postmodern art, which is art after about um, the 1880s. So from the 1880s to current. And it includes uh, a lot of the manifesto uh, avant-garde types, the, the abstract expressionist, um, the reactions to that through the 60s, what's called contemporary art. And then nobody's really decided what they're calling the art today. It's just, it's post-contemporary, I guess. Any other questions? What was your main motivation to go into art school? Well, so I got diagnosed with heart failure. Yeah. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to go back to my job. Uh, number one, because I could barely walk at the time. And number two, because it was, it was so stressful that, you know, it was going to, it would kill me if I went back to that job. So being a combat veteran, um, I'm very fortunate to have access to some VA benefits. And I went to the VA and they said, okay, we've got this vocational rehabilitation program where we will send you to school um, to retrain for another career that suits your disability. And so I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I like school, I like going to school. You like it more and more the older you get. Let me tell you, it's a lot better than work, anyway. Um, <laughs> So I went to the VA and I said, let's do it. And they give you an aptitude test, which is, it's interesting because you, I mean, you can figure out which way the, the aptitude's going, you know, whether it's going towards being a mechanic or being a, an artist or, you know, being a teacher. Or, you know, it's pretty obvious from the questions. Uh, I made my mind up when I went in to take that aptitude test that I was not going to do anything day to day that I hated anymore. I was not going to go into a job. That I, I mean, I was not going to have a job because as the comedian Chris Rock says, the difference between a job and a career is you go in and you hate a job every day. You look at the clock and you, every time you look up at it, it looks like it hasn't moved a bit. And a career is something that you look forward to going to every day, and that you that you love and you would do even though even if someone weren't paying you for it. And I wanted a career. I wanted that. I wanted that enjoyment out of life. I was tired of working for you know money. Money is it's it's pretty important if you don't have any. I've learned that because I don't have any now. But. Uh, but I've gotten a lot more out of art than I did 22 years of being a computer network engineer. A lot more. And I hadn't even started working with it. So. I can take short answers and make them really long. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Is there an order to the way these small ones are arranged in this? Absolutely not. They're just completely random except that um, I tried not to put images of the same that were almost identical next to each other. So if they were if they were the same color, same value, same image, and everything, I tried to separate them a little bit. But that's the only thing I did as far as the composition. Other than that, it's just you know. Thanks, Tom. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And feel free to, to pick these up, and I mean, you're not going to hurt them. All they are is newspaper and, and Italian prints. So if you want to look at any of this stuff, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely come touch the artwork, because that's really rare that you get to come feel other people's things.